Is a better world truly possible? Can we achieve a peaceful, just, sustainable future where people around the globe coexist with one another and nature in the true spirit of harmony? And will we get to have more sex without worrying about the criticism? All this and more on this week's episode of The Point. Stick around. Welcome to The Point. Oftentimes we discuss very specific issues that are making headlines and current events news. But today on the show, we want to focus on the big picture. We want to focus on broader topics and how we can actually change our system, how we can make things better on this planet. So we're going to do so by focusing on three different topics. We're going to look at the zeitgeist movement and we're going to discuss whether or not it makes sense to scrap our system and start from scratch. Then we're going to discuss uh, the media's role in making us close-minded. Is that a legitimate concern? We'll discuss uh, that with our panel. And then finally, when are we going to get to have more sex? And when are people going to be less critical about that? So of course, we got we to gotta put a little salacious stuff into the show, of course. Um, but before we get to all of that, let's meet our intelligent, excellent panelists today. Uh, Ramesh Srinivasan is an associate professor at the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies and Design Media Arts at UCLA. He works on projects that look at how new media technologies impact political revolutions, economic development, poverty, and people from diverse cultures and communities worldwide. I understand you just got back yesterday from visiting the uh, Zapatistas in Mexico? Yeah, it was incredible. Uh -huh. um, my partner and I were um, out living and working with um, some of the Zapatista communities in the rainforests and in the cloud forests and um, looking at what lessons we can, um, we can um, pertain to the larger world that come out of the movement there. That is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then we have Sikivu Hutchinson. Uh, she is an activist and author whose most recent book is Moral Combat, Black Atheists, Gender Politics, and The Value Wars. She, she's also a senior fellow with the Institute of Humanist Studies and has taught women's studies, urban studies, cultural studies, and education at the California Institute of the Arts, UCLA, and Western Washington University. She's also a contributor to LA Progressive Magazine, and she came to us highly recommended by our friends Sharon Kyle and Dick Price. Thank you so much for joining us on the program today. Good to be here. And last but not least is Tom Shadiak. Uh, he is a writer and director behind such films as Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, Liar Liar, Bruce Almighty, The Nutty Pro Professor, among others. Uh, more to the point of today's discussion, he also wrote and directed the 2011 documentary I Am, in which he spoke to some of the world's leading scientists, religious leaders, environmentalists, and philosoph philosophers to find the answers to two key questions and what which questions were those uh, what's wrong with the world and what can we do about it and I have a third question can we get to the sex part I'm only kidding uh, <laughs> that's actually I'm what the audience kidding. is thinking uh, right the now. audience is like fast-forwarding <laughs> the two segments get me to yeah, the sex yeah, part yeah yeah uh, but no what's wrong with the world and, and what can we do about it you know I wanted to start a conversation not about the symptoms which I thought were we keep talking about but what is the dynamic that creates these symptoms that seem to have poisoned the world? Well, that's a question that Peter Joseph from the Zeitgeist Movement asks himself and his followers on a regular basis. So let's go to his point where he discusses the Zeitgeist Movement in a little more detail. Hello, my name is Peter Joseph and I work with a global sustainability advocacy group called the Zeitgeist Movement, which works to do exactly what his name suggests, and that's to move away from the dominant detrimental values and practices of the current Zeitgeist. Because of time, I'm simply going to ask a question for consideration. What if all of the societal issues on the tip of people's tongues today, such as the growing wealth gap, ecological destabilization, poverty, the debt crisis, the unemployment crisis, and other ongoing points of focus in the activism community, what if those were all found to have no possibility for true long-term resolution within the current socioeconomic system we share? As far as I'm concerned, the problem is not political parties, corporate influence, governmental regulation, or lack thereof. The problem is psychological and hence sociological, as we have an outdated global economic tradition in place that literally rewards and reinforces those very problems. Imbalance, conflict, scarcity, exploitation, waste production, maintaining societal problems create advantage, an income-producing phenomenon. So it's naive to think humans would walk against what works in their favor on that basic level, as far as I'm concerned. So my suggestion is we either accept the current detrimental socioeconomic system with all its inherent problems, because it's never going to get much better. They're built in. 
or we begin to think more scientifically out of the box with regard to prior traditions, realizing that until the entire social system is uprooted and replaced by a system that actually rewards and reinforces ethical practices, balance, rather than literally oppressing them by design, nothing will ever change. Thank you for listening to zeitgeistmovement.com. One of the points that the Zeitgeist Movement makes that I find fascinating is the fact that they want to get rid of the monetary system and focus on a resource-based economy, which is it's a fascinating point of view. But Ramesh, I want to start with you. What are your thoughts on his core belief that sure. our current system is so corrupt, so rotten, that we need to kind of get rid of it and start from scratch? Right. So there's something, um, the ideas are very interesting. There's, however, something really fatalistic and really dismissive about what's going on here in this video clip and I think the larger movement. Um, by existing in the clouds and by arguing for changes in systems and claiming that there are no solutions to the problems that exist today, even on a large and grand scale, there's actually something dismissive implicit within that. Because if you actually look at the history of the world and you look at the world as it stands today, there are alternate paradigms that are emerging from people who are in their own environments, in their own worlds, and are trying to enact forms of social change give you an example, the Arab Spring. I've been working on the ground there for the last two years. I've been studying how people are actively changing their societies there in a democratic, grassroots manner, using the help of labor unions, using mosques in creative ways, using international media networks and filmmakers and activists such as yourselves in creative ways. And that's actually introducing new paradigms of social change. So there's no, this idea that the, world is, the world's problems are insurmountable is highly dismissive of the solutions that are actually existing in people, their efforts, their activism, and their hearts and their minds in the world as it exists today. Sikivu, what do you think? Because you know we are seeing we're seeing some big changes, especially when it comes to the Arab world. But then you know when you look at other issues, like for instance gay rights, that comes to mind. You're seeing incremental changes. Um, and and are we so bogged down by those very specific issues that we're not focusing enough on the system itself, which tends to be corrupt? Well, I don't think that these things are mutually exclusive. So I would agree with Ramesh that we have to look at it in terms of what are people doing in their local communities to actually affect change in ways that confer them with political agency. So if we go back and look, for example, at the, the primary social justice movement of the mid 20th century, the struggle for civil rights you know, within African American, uh, deep south, you know, racial apartheid impacted communities. That change was affected by working class African American women, primarily domestics, primarily um, lower income women that were really pushing the paradigm of plutocracy towards democracy mm -hmm. and really deconstructing this whole notion that American democracy was inclusive for everyone when in fact we know it was based upon these extremely institutionalized principles of injustice, of apartheid, of dispossession, of disenfranchisement. And you had whole movements of black women really at the forefront of this nexus of feminist social justice and anti-racist change. And so that has been a legacy for LGBTQ equality movements, for undocumented young people, for um, new third wave generations of feminists. So I think that this notion that we somehow need to quote unquote scrap the existing power structure mm -hmm. and really foreclose possibilities for people to forge constructive and deep and abiding change within their local communities is again this elitist, you know, very reductive, very first world posture mm -hmm. that is destructive. It's really interesting. Tom, what are your thoughts on that? I think they're smart. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> these guys are smart. Um, I, I think it looks at it upside down. Uh, it, it, you mentioned the civil rights movement. So the system uh, that we have says that all of us are created equal. So that's our system. But what happened was we weren't all equal because people were the problem people's perspectives, people's morality, if you will. And so even within a system that said all people are created equal, we weren't until we changed. So what I see is uh, uh, this idea that when systems change, which can be helpful, but when systems change, change, it's all gonna change, and I don't agree. Because you can have a perfect system 
and if imp imperfect people populate that perfect system with imperfect morality and, 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 and limited value sets, then that system is going to run amok. Ramesh? So, yeah, I mean, I think this is both what, what both my friends here are saying is actually really wonderful. If you look at every form of systems, every, every form of social change that emerges out of large-scale systems, from philosophical systems to biological systems, how change is introduced is not by philosophizing some alternate reality. It's actually introduced by looking at elements within the grassroots, elements within a species, like when birds fly in different ways, new patterns emerge. So things percolate from the bottom up. New paradigms emerge from within paradigms, but while, but while people within those paradigms or organizations within those paradigms contest those paradigms themselves. The Zapatista movement, which I've been you know, in, involved with for the last couple of weeks, is a great example of that. These people uh, wanted control over their own land. Their land was being commodified by the Mexican government in partnership with NAFTA and the United States. And they said, we're, we're not going to stand for this any longer. They developed an autonomous relationship to the government and then used that autonomy to actually broadcast that to the world. So there's large amounts of sympathy that are associated with an old school local movement. So these paradigms are introduced from the grassroots biologically, philosophically, economically. These international movements are definitely inspiring, but I can't help but look at our own system and look at our own efforts at real social change and how we've failed so far. I mean, and I'm talking about uh, in modern times with the Occupy movement, uh, with our current financial system and the fact that, you know, uh, the big corporations and the banks still get away with doing the things that put us in this economic mess in the first place. So, you know, the Zeitgeist movement would argue that because of the power structure that we have, it's very difficult to really push for any real social change. How far do you think things would have to go? How bad would things have to get in the United States where you would see that grassroots movement that would actually lead to significant change? How about 20 kids getting shot? Mm -hmm. yeah. how, about, how about guns in our schools uh, as, as all too regular a story? Well, I mean, how about criminalization of people of color here in right. South Los Angeles, in you know the United States? Um, that being um, an absolute travesty. If we're talking about this is one of the most great, you know, most powerful, uh, you know, most civilized democracies on the planet. That's an absolute travesty. You know that we have scores and scores of young people of color who are being pipelined into prisons do not have meaningful and equitable college access in supposedly the greatest 21st century democracy that the, na that, uh, the globe has ever seen. So how do we change that, though? So, so we, we are actually on our way to changing this. And part of this is because the lessons that are being taught to us you know, in the Arab world or other parts of the world, including historically, like you're alluding to, and contemporarily, are actually spreading to mainstream populations. The issue with the Occupy movement is that people's uh, issues and their, and, their, and their concerns are real, and they're still organizing around those concerns. But what broke the back of the Mubarak regime in Egypt was massive labor strikes massive shutdowns of using institutions to cripple regimes and to change power in that way. The Occupy movement is super powerful in many elements of it. There are critiques of it, but the institutionalization of that movement, how it gets associated with you know, political change, institutions, labor, and so on, that's the element that's still yet to come. But I have a lot of optimism that we can continue learning these lessons from different parts of the world. I, look, I have this really simplistic, some will call it naive belief that none of these systems are there by accident. Mm -hmm. They're all outgrowths, reflections of who we are. Mm -hmm. so, so until we shift, this is why Gandhi's whole message was, they said, what's your message, Mr. Gandhi? And he says, my life is my message. So we're all preaching and we're all either adding to or breaking the system down with our lives. You know, you, you are working through, for social change with your life. You've identified what you're about. This is why I think the Occupy movement is in flux, because Occupy was against something. It wasn't creating a for something that was more powerful. So, so I want to speak to this issue of, of the Occupy movement, because one thing that I thought was really elided within you know, the larger discourse was this massive issue of institutionalized racial apartheid in this country, and the fact that African Americans and Latinos um, are increasing as far as the population is concerned, and that we do not see any meaningful address, you know, from a democratic administration, a centrist, you know, to some would say conservative reactionary administration. There's no meaningful address of 
the fact that blacks and browns have less net worth, significantly less net worth than do white Americans across the socioeconomic spectrum. The fact that we're looking at Pulse Brown v. Board and you have a condition where African American and Latino upwardly mobile households are living in very stratified, very segregated communities where they're deeply impacted by these corporate practices of predatory lending, of subprime lending, um, of being foreclosed on in disproportionate numbers. So that's not something that was really meaningfully addressed sure. by Occupy, where you have this discourse within the mainstream you know, GOP sphere that constantly demonizes and criminalizes people of color as not being within the realm of the American dream, mm -hmm. not subscribing to you know, the bootstraps, you know, free enterprise, um, individualist ethos. So in order for there to be any meaningful you know, deconstruction you know, of our current system, yeah. there has to be some reckoning with this legacy of white supremacy mm -hmm. and white privilege and the way in which that's enacted in the very real lives of white working class people you know, as the you know, primary constituency of the GOP and the lives of emergent communities of color you know, that are really pushing the envelope for social justice and anti-racist and feminist and you know, LGBTQ struggle in the United States. Well, can, I, can I get under that for one second? Absolutely. Because this is a beautiful articulation of, 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 of a stuck point. Mm. And, and all our mystics and philosophers and saints and sages have gotten under this point by saying we simply haven't recognized that we're all brothers and sisters. I can't be supreme and call, use the word supremacy with anyone who is a family member, sure. who has by right and by birth all the dignity that would be offered to any human being. We have yet to embrace that point. And until we do, and by the way, science is proving this now. You know the human genome study said, hey, we all come from the same uh, two parents in sub-Saharan Africa, so we are genetically all brothers and sisters, sure. period. It's proven, so it's not a philosophical trope. Until we get that, we will continue to create systems that don't see things as they are. That's why the, I believe it's a mental illness that has run rampant in our country. We're not seeing the reality of our connection. Well, related to that is the American obsession, and not necessarily only American, but the obsession with status. And you're seeing that here in the U.S., and it plays into a lot of different problems that we have. One of the main problems that comes to mind is this notion of overconsumption. The more you consume, the more materialistic you are, the more you have, the better you are and there's this constant competition and I'm really wondering if that's something that is inherent or if it's something that's learned and what is your thought on that because if it's something that's inherent wouldn't you argue that any system isn't really gonna matter people are always gonna be competitive to the point where they're gonna try to stab their I peer would, in the back I would love to speak to that Go since ahead. I am and have been the mental illness that you're speaking of mm -hmm. where we are taught a certain way that isn't necessarily true so I, if you haven't seen I Am, I am a successful quote unquote director, got a lot of stuff, got all the trappings of that lifestyle, private yeah. jets, mansions, et cetera, was paid an undue sum of money for my talent, which I now believe I should serve with, mm. was given all this money and guess what? It didn't make me any happier. It was very neutral, it wasn't bad, it wasn't good. In some ways it was challenging because it disconnects you from people, from justice, but it was very neutral. So what we have been taught, I don't believe is innate and inherent in us. Now as I've given more of that wealth away, shared my time and talent freely, all of a sudden I'm waking up to happiness because I have conversations like this, I meet engaged people like this, I'm opening up to community, to service, all those things are making me happier. So we're being told something that's not true. I've experienced it personally, I am the petri dish for this. Mm -hmm. and, and it is not true, so I don't believe in any way it's inherent in us. That's why America is not one of the happiest countries in the world. We're always like 20 or 25. Sure. I love that you brought that up, that, that recent study. I believe Pew did that study, right? Yeah, uh, there's been many studies yeah. for, in this field of positive psychology, and I made a film about this, I produced it. Rocco Bell made the film on happiness, and it's always Denmark or someone else who's got a, 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 a grander view of, of, of the societal um, uh, issues. Surprisingly, Latin American countries tend to be happier than the United States. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. We Bangladesh just, beat us at one point. Yeah. Yeah. Bangladesh yeah. beat us at one point. Sure. You think, wait, we have all the stuff, sure. but stuff doesn't do it. It's the stuff of relationship, of love, of kindness. 
of creativity, of serving. Mm -hmm. so, so there's this place, I just want to bring it all back together. There's this place between what Tom is saying and um, what Sikibu is pointing out, which is actually where Tom's humanism, Tom's point about being humanistic, embracing love, embracing service, embracing causes of social justice actually aligns very very clearly in my mind with what you're, what you're explaining, Sikivu, which is actually when you actually align yourself in service of the fact that we are all humans, we are all Americans, however, we are very disproportionately stratified as Americans, disproportionately in a racial, ethnic, gendered, class-based sense. Mm -hmm. So actually, when you actually open yourself up to that reality and be of service, work in various communities, there's great amounts of learning and wealth that's accrued through that process. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I had to do that, had to engage in that very same experience myself when I was offered jobs at Google and so on, yeah. and I said, well, I'll be an academic, but actually use this as a jumping off point to try to stand for causes that relate to peoples who have not had the voice that I've had, mm. the privileged voice that I've had in my own life, and try to serve and listen. So I want to bring it back to that point in terms of the yeah. humanism of service yeah. and this whole issue of legacies. Um, I think it's really significant that you have undocumented young people, Latino, Asian, you know, African descent, that are drawing from the legacies of civil rights struggle that are actually looking back at, you know, let's go to, you know, Little Rock, Arkansas, you know, and converge with those leaders, you know, with those young activists and see, you know, what were the models and the lessons, you know, that we can take from that trajectory. We see that, you know, with um, the LGBTQ movement in terms of, you know, young people really reaching back and what were, you know, the struggles of, say, you know, Stonewall and thereafter. Mm -hmm. And that's an aspect of, you know, American collectivity and humanism that I think is not really foregrounded okay. and really needs to be integrated into some type of, you know, culturally responsive, uh, multicultural notion, you know, of public education. And we're seeing that if we could shift, you know, to this issue of, you know, how K through 12 is, is really under attack, you know, by corporatization, by privatization. Yes. That's something that's being gutted, you know, that there, sense of critical there's, consciousness. There's something very deeply rooted in the historical American ethos that is about a public, that is about a pragmatism that, you know, for example, Dr. Cornell West engages with. Haven't we with. moved away from that, though? I, I, I feel like in current times, yes, I, I feel like that's what this country was about at one time, right? right. And it was about helping individuals. It was about giving back. But as we're having this lovely, compassionate discussion, Discussion. <laughs> Oddly enough, the thing that's coming in the back of my head is the person who's, you know, in the back of my head mm -hmm. is John Boehner. Okay, and I'm thinking, how do you convince the John Boehners of the world to give a crap about other people? You know, how do you convince the people yeah, that have been so brainwashed by the overconsumption and, and the status and the competitiveness, how do you convince those people to let that go? So, so the way you change power and impact power, as I've seen firsthand, is not through these sort of elected representatives who are essentially stooges of, of the corporate machine. Mm -hmm. And you don't also change it through kind of ethereal alternative non-human philosophizing like the zeitgeist movement. You change it through social movements and forms of community struggle that emerge from the grassroots and introduce new paradigms of social change, like what we're talking about. And that's really the way to do it. We're not going to be able to change John Boehner by giving him a phone call. We're going to change him by creating a movement that he can't help but listen to. See, this is where the, where the power is. I don't consider them our leaders in Washington. I think they're our followers. And the second we give them something to follow, Emerson, so you will mop and sweep floors so that the effulgent day beams of the divine uh, will shine forth and you'll make others want to grab mops and brooms. Uh -huh. yeah. And we need to make others want to grab mops and brooms, not because we criticize them and say, you guys don't know what we know, but because we're living something that's so powerful, check it out. We're going to get to sexiness at the end of the show, but it really is about living a life that is really <laughs> sexier with more joy, yes. more life. And, and, and there's something fulfilling about knowing that you're doing something that helps others. You know, it, it, of course, it, it's, it's nice to live a comfortable lifestyle, but I think we put too much emphasis on the materialistic aspects of society and not enough emphasis on helping our, human, our, our fellow humans. Um, so this is, this is definitely a great conversation. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, but unfortunately, we got to take a quick break. Let's do that, and when we come back, we'll talk about the media's role in all of this. Sex is coming. Thank you. 
Welcome back to The Point. If science fiction is to be believed, the future looks pretty bleak. Whether we're all competing for the survival with a few other remaining humans in a post-apocalyptic moonscape, we're subjugated and enslaved by another primate species, we're desperately trying to keep zombies from eating us, or we just over-reproduce ourselves into widespread stupefaction, the sci-fi future doesn't bode well for humanity. But if, as the saying goes, another world is possible, do these depictions of all the horror shows that might await prevent us from seeing a path to a peaceful, sustainable, harmonious future, one where machines aren't rising up to exterminate us and zombies aren't after our brains? So basically what we want to focus on in this segment <laughs> yeah. um, is the media's role in any type of movement that tries to emerge in this country. Yeah. Um, is, the, is the media machine basically discouraging us from thinking outside the box? Yeah. Well, there is no media machine, uh, in my mind. There are people who make movies inside of a system, if you will, that is imperfect. Um, and there are a lot of things emerging. That story is one side, and then there's another story emerging. The new world's happening. Mm -hmm. uh, even if some of these science fiction films paint a very bleak future, the new world is being born. If you read Jeremy Rifkin, Rifkin's book, The Empathic Civilization, he talks about the unreported story of the human species is that we are tending toward openness, kindness, compassion, and love. You look at the story and we are moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. So it's inside of media, it still exists, but now we see it as the aberration because we're still inside of the sickness. Mm -hmm. And media is just, again, a reflection of where we are. Again, we in the media are very much, it, it, uh, unfortunately, we are all too often followers of what the, what the zeitgeist is in the world. Yeah. So, um, but you, you can see movies, uh, Groundhog's Day, uh, that's the future. Stay in the moment, stay in the now, feel the blessings of this moment. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a wonderful life. Here's a guy who's got a whole new system inside of the system. He just serves with his life. Right? He doesn't take the big job of the money and get out and go get the stuff and the things. He stays and, he, and he's the richest guy in town. So we have these examples and more are going to come as we, and I made another film, I Am, which I hope people will see, but it talks about what that new world is, which is actually being born. So it's interesting to hear that from a you know, movie maker's perspective, someone who works in film, but when you look at the type of media that the public chooses to focus on. For instance, yeah. the big news story of the weekend was the fact that uh, Kim Kardashian was impregnated. Um, and, and the m majority of people, for some reason or another, want to focus on that as opposed to uh, you know, real social change in the country. I mean, you do a show on social change, I'm sure the show will do fine, but it's not going to get nearly the, the ratings that uh, Keeping Up with the Kardashians would. So is, is it really the media's fault or is it the population's fault. And I know you touched on that a little bit, Tom, but I want to get everyone else's thoughts on that. Well, I think that Please. the media has uh, a fair share of blame here mm -hmm. in terms of this oversaturation, you know, of idiocy and frivolity and this hyper performativeness of, you know, the everyday that, you know, the Kardashians signify. Um, but in terms of the impact on the lived experiences and the cultural and social capital of, say, young people, you know, who I think are more gravely impacted by it. Um, I see it with the young people that I work with in the Los Angeles Unified School District. And you have them, you know, literally internalizing, you know, very destructive, very misogynist, you know, very racist perspectives about themselves, you know, in terms of their self-worth, um, in terms of their, you know, sense of value, um, in terms of their gender relations, in terms of sexual orientation. Um, these are very insidious influences, and they're 24-7, they're all around them, you know, they're pervasive, and unfortunately, it's really foreclosing a deeper sense of critical consciousness about how they're situated within an incredibly oppressive, white supremacist, um, inequitable power structure. So it's really, it's really important, in my opinion, to not necessarily demonize the media as is or demonize people as it stands, because all forms of media are ways of telling stories, right? So you can tell a story in a particular way that can be really palatable to a large population, but introduce ideas that, can, that, that have paradigms of social change built into it. Tom alluded to a couple of these. Um, you can think even of Trum The Truman Show as yeah, another beautiful. example of this. Mainstream film, huge film that introduces new types of stories. Um, 
the media is, as it stands, rigged in the same way that John Boehner is rigged, right? So it's rigged in a sense where simple forms of consumption, easy forms of capitalism, actually privilege the media in certain ways. However, if we introduce movements, like we talked about in the previous um, segment, that actually force and shake the system from the grassroots, the media has no choice but to respond in various ways to this. And what we can do is actually look at, for example, what people do to create alternatives, not just using mainstream media, not just using film, but social media, which is what I study. I, yeah, that's, that's actually a great point. In fact, the reason why the Arab Spring was so successful is because of the use of social media. So do you see social media as something becoming so big that it will make mainstream media obsolete? So the, the reason why the Arab Spring and social media worked well together was because people's movements, their purposes, their voices as they stood on the ground were integrated with their uses of various technologies. Of course, the Arab Spring would not have happened without these sorts of grassroots, labor-driven, youth-driven movements that had nothing to do with social media. However, their ability to exploit technologies to allow them to globalize their struggle and build networks was absolutely critical. So it's really important to understand that in media do not lie the solution. In alternative paradigms and social movements lie new possibilities. Mm. What about the notion that media kind of keeps us in the box and discourage us, discourages us from thinking outside the box? For instance, if anyone says something that seems a little strange or says something that's a little different, they're immediately cast off as someone who's radical. I don't know why this comes to mind, but uh, when Kucinich said that he believed in, um, you know, extraterrestrials or, you know, <laughs> and everyone made fun of him for months after that. And, you know, I don't really think that that's the craziest thing that an individual can say. Um, do you think that media is, is kind of discouraging people from sharing their beliefs and sharing their thoughts, which could then snowball into a real movement. Uh, it can, and it can have the opposite effect. You know, if mm -hmm. he was criticized for that, I'm, I'm not aware of, the, uh, of that particular uh, time or incident, but if he was criticized uh, for that, he's in a long line of people that have been told they were crazy, and then you have to stand up and courage and say, actually, I think it's maybe reasonable that there may be other life. Mm -hmm. on, on other planets. Look, I, I want to get under this again because I teach, I've, I've taught in the inner city, I still teach in the inner city, I teach at college, I teach at uh, uh, university level Pepperdine. And um, the reason I've done a lot of studies on this, because I want people to go see these films, I want them to go see documentaries that wake them up to yeah. our history, to where we can go, and they don't want to go. And the reason they don't want to go is the kids are exhausted because our system is preaching an ideology and a philosophy that can't last, which is you've got to compete and beat each other. Mm. So all our kids are destroyed by this idea that you're not a brother or sister to be elevated, you are a competitor to be, to be beaten. And if I don't beat you, I lose. And so they're exhausted. And so as a guru once said to me, you can't uh, feed a sick culture spicy soup. Mm. And many of these ideas we're talking about are spicy. They require challenge and courage. So we feed our kids broth and that's what they go to. So it's this over-idealization of competition. Even schools themselves have to be rethought. And it can't be about beating each other, but mm. helping each other yeah. and, and bring out your talent and your brilliance and let me help with that. Help me in my articulations. Yeah. And until we get to that level, we're gonna keep having this conversation. Isn't education itself competitive though? I mean, look at the way we've structured our educational system. I mean, you wanna to go to the best university. Sure. Which That's university is yeah. ranked the highest? I mean, sure. there's always an emphasis yeah. on competitiveness, even when it comes to something as important and as enlightening as education. Well, absolutely. As a university professor at a public university, I have to say that we, are, we have concerns about the fact that we are not as diverse as we should be and we need to be more diverse even at the University of California system and we talk about this all the time however what's really important is for us to kind of think again through social movements about new paradigms that understand that learning occurs through cooperation and collaboration which doesn't mean we all agree on the same thing right. but we talk about it with one right. another and that those right. ideas that we have different opinions about the same thing is not competition in the one-upsmanship right. but in the idea that there's emergence that happens yes. through negotiation of different perspectives yes that's the original intention of competition is to strive with it's from the word competer which means to mm. strive with mm. I want to bring out the best with you let's go run who's faster yeah. wow you're faster and and the the excellence can then rise to the mm. surface but the spoil of uh, uh, to the winner belongs a spoil mm. is all the poison and the like if you screaming. win native cultures didn't give the fastest runner all the tribes resources yeah. they said wow you're the fastest runner what's for dinner you know in yeah. our culture says you're the fastest runner you get it all so we create a culture that, mm -hmm. and, and youth that say, I can never be 
Kobe Bryant or LeBron. I can never be that. There can only be one in a generation, and so I'm defeated. Yeah. What would you say to those that would argue that if you don't incentivize, incentivize uh, greatness, then people will not strive uh, to do better? I would argue that the incentive is built into the act. Right? So if I offer myself in service and do what I can to bring out your excellence in mine, the incentive is in the act. Like the incentive, we, we have this insane idea that money is the only incentive. If you don't incentivize me with money, I'm never going to do anything yeah. creative. I've let go of that ghost because it's an illusion, it's a ghost. And I've now embraced a true incentive which I can maybe contribute to my society. Through my talents and offering my service, I can get the ultimate incentive which is to actually be a member of the human family and to experience love and community and the things that we go to our grave with and say that was valuable. We, 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 the, the rich man going to, to his grave is not who anyone wants to be. All, all the lessons that we're sharing right now just come from the fact that all three of us have worked in communities and sort of realized the limitations of just sort of living in pulpits or living in elite castles or private jets or what, what, what have you. Mm -hmm. um, and that that actually, greatness is manifold, right? Greatness comes from any form of service, any form of love, and just all, any, any, peop, any of us who have just the opportunity to spend a little time being of service to others can experience that. It's so enriching. Is that not a powerful incentive, though? It is a powerful incentive, but I don't think that the majority of people understand that a tremendous amount of wealth doesn't necessarily bring you happiness. I think that in our media, you know, going back to the media discussion, we are constantly being told over and over again yeah. that this wealth, that the overconsumption that I keep going back to is what will lead to happiness. We see it in reality shows, we see it on the news, we see it in the glorification of Wall Street. Um, so it's difficult to change mindsets, especially when, you know, the vast majority of people in this country will never experience that kind of wealth and will never know firsthand what it's like to have that, those so-called privileges and right. realize that it's not necessarily what brings you happiness. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is, again, circling back to the issue of you know, the capitalist regime, that it's part and parcel of that, that um, this commodity fetishism is really part and parcel of the soullessness you know, of capitalism and the degree to which you know, capitalism you know, really festers and it's really entrenched you know, by these deep and abiding divisions you know, of race, of gender, of sexual orientation, of spatial you know, geography and community. And so circling back to the issue of you know, media being sort of mixed in terms of you know, its, its gifts and its deficits, Media literacy can be a way for young people to actually look back at the connection between these paradigms of, say, hyper-racialization and sexualization. I'm thinking specifically of the way that women of color are depicted within mainstream media as yeah. being, you know, very hypersexual, you know, Jezebels on the one hand, or, you know, being these, you know, asexual, you know, font of, you know, hyper-religiosity and caregiving on the other hand. Mm -hmm. We can see those paradigms, you know, manifest all the way back, you know, to the era of the institutionalization of racial slavery. And then, you know, Absolutely. if we look at those paradigms and really juxtapose them with, you know, these contemporary paradigms, media really offers, you know, a platform for developing this critical consciousness, yeah. you know, about how social change can be, you know, impacted, you know, within the K through 12 context and within the community-based context. Ramesh, I'm gonna let you what, have the last word. I'm honored. <laughs> uh, what's increasingly powerful is with the increased democratization of technology, five billion people having mobile phones today, three to four billion people with internet access, is the possibility to tell new stories, not in a preachy way, mm -hmm. but tell stories from people's lives. Because what we see when we work around the world or in the communities that both my friends here work within, is people living their lives in ways that don't necessarily fit into this top-down, consumption-driven paradigm. So the way we do it is we tell new stories. We can tell stories in ways that everybody can feel good about, but actually introduce new hopes and new ideas of what change is and what change can be. All right, I, I definitely think we should maybe stop idolizing those who have the most money and, and focus on idolizing those that actually do good for our communities. I don't think we do enough of that in the media. Anyway, let's take a quick break. When we come back, the segment you've all been waiting for, sex, when are we gonna be able to have more of it without the criticism? Yeah. We'll be back. Welcome back to The Point. Our last point comes to us from a huge friend of the show, Christopher Ryan, author of uh, Sex at Dawn, which is also a New York, New York Times bestseller, so make sure you check it out. Let's take a look at what he has to say about our 
feelings towards sex. Hi, my name is Christopher Ryan, and yes, my house is cold. But that's not my point. My point is that probably the most important single step we could make toward a more livable world would involve uh, widespread understanding, promoting this understanding that human sexuality is not primarily about reproduction. Human beings have sex about a thousand times per birth. Gorillas and other mammals, 10 to 15. Human beings have sex when the female cannot possibly get pregnant. We have sex when women are menstruating, when they're already pregnant, when they're postmenopausal, when they're breastfeeding, all situations that are very unlikely to lead to pregnancy. This is very unusual in the animal world, and most people don't appreciate that. Once we understood that human sexuality is primarily about establishing and maintaining social networks, about building trust and intimacy, not about having babies, then we can decouple our sexual lives from our family lives, which will result in much greater familial stability and also, I hope, much greater respect for LGBT people because we'll understand that those relationships, the fact that those relationships don't result in babies doesn't matter because most relationships, most sexual interactions don't result in babies anyway. That's not what they're about. Also, I hope it would result in a more generalized support for women and children on a social level so that women aren't in a position where they have to barter their sexuality for child care and financial support from individual men. That shouldn't be necessary. We should evolve beyond that. Once we do, I think we'll find everybody will be a lot happier. Anyway, that's my point. You can find out more about these ideas at sexatdawn.com, or you can check out my podcast, which is called Tangentially Speaking, on iTunes or at feralaudio.com. Wow. That was a great point by Chris Ryan. And Sikivu, I want to start with you. What do you think about the idea of changing our attitudes towards sex to, uh, you know, so it'll lead to greater social change in the country? Well, I don't think that that point was particularly revelatory. I mean, this is mm -hmm. something that um, has been propounded by, you know, feminists, second, you know, third wave, fourth wave feminists. It's a linchpin, you know, of feminist ideology. If we look at the trajectory of American politics over the past three years in particular, and we look at you know, the incredible assault on women's rights by primarily the Christian fascist you know, GOP right, the cornerstone has been trying to appropriate women's reproduction you know, as this avenue you know, for exercise of state power. And in my view, Yes, decoupling, you know, sex, you know, from reproduction is a noble goal, but I think we have to look more particularly at the socioeconomic policies yeah. that, you know, really inform the way in which, you know, reproduction and sex, you know, are postulated within the American mainstream. And if we look at, for example, a lot of the imagery, you know, that emerged, you know, over the past couple of years, it really demonized the reproductive capacities of women of color. There was a big billboard campaign that um, a lot of the far-right um, philanthropic organizations got on the bandwagon of. You had uh, organizations like um, uh, the Conservative Partnership you know, for Latinos getting on the bandwagon of these billboards that more or less said that the most dangerous place for a black or Latino child was in the wombs of you know, black and Latino breeder women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this aspect of, you know, the women of color, you know, being the font of, you know, all that is dangerous, you know, all that is undermining, you know, of American civilization in terms of our values is something that's, you know, deeply connected to this notion, you know, that sexuality, again, you know, needs to be harnessed, you know, by the state, more specifically, you know, a very right wing, you know, reactionary, you know, conservative notion of what families should resemble. So how do we move away from that? Because as much as we like to pretend that religion is not a dominant force in our society, it is, and it totally influences people's perspectives on sexual activity, especially when it comes to women. And how do we move away from that? How do we change that so we do accept this idea of sex as something that leads to social networks? I mean, it's so, it sounds like an oversimplification, sure, but it's, it's, sure. it's true, it's true. We don't always have sex to reproduce, Chris well, Ryan is right. 
Well, first of all, I was raised Catholic, so I'm not going to be your expert on this subject. Um, I didn't even know you could have sex at dawn. So, um, uh, and a thousand times, really, per pregnancy? Holy uh -huh. hell. I've got about 970 to catch up on. Okay. Um, that being said, um, this I look, sex is our ultimate expression of the celebration of who we are. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we it, it, intimacy means into me see. You know, so we're real. It's a re way of coming together. Literally, that's the expression coming that was, together. That was beautiful. I know that. Well, thank you, Sigmund. <laughs> um, um, but what we have to do to control people, and what many religions have done, is to co-opt that control. Is to c grab that and say, no, no, no. I can't have you being free. Yeah. I need you to report to me about your freedom and your dignity. Right. Mm -hmm. And this is why, you know, and again, as being raised in the Catholic Church, you see so much abuse uh, of, of altar boys and others because the truth is being suppressed. The yes. truth is we are sexual beings. And until we, in the puritanical state of America, understand that, embrace all of who we are, we're going to have this, this, kind of, this kind of issue. So there's this story out of Spain that I read about today, and uh, this specific school is trying to raise money for a school bus. And uh, the mothers of some of the students decided to pose nude uh, or topless in some sort of calendar to raise money for the school bus. And the reason why I bring up that story is because mm -hmm. if something like that happened here in the United States, it would be a huge scandal, right? And those women would be just, the brutal criticism that they would face in the media is, yeah, of course, you would expect that to happen. So what is it about American society that makes us so different from other countries mm. that are more accepting of, um, mm. you know, of sex? So, mm. so again, on this issue, I'm going to be hopeful about what is core American and what I think is truly American that has been, has been sort of, you know, put to the side in recent years. And, and, and I think the point that Sikivu as well as Tom are making are really important, which is that this is more largely an issue about the demonization of women of color mm -hmm. and the demonization of women more generally. And I think the important thing to remember is that when we generate sort of, whenever you kind of, whenever you use institutions of power to actually create notions of what is normative or not or what is legal or not, you create sort of very strange, erratic, you know, deviant forms of behavior which are not healthy for a society. So I think the important thing to remember is that this isn't something that's necessarily inherently American. This is about America being taken hostage. This, this is where we really have to look at our media. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very critical of this in, 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 in the fact that uh, if you show those women with their breasts giving, you know, a, a, an image to the world to, to raise money, you can't do that suddenly. Uh, People of a certain age can't go to that movie, but you can chop their legs off, cut their heads off, stab them, all kinds of violence, and that's fine. We can send our children to that. Um, there's a movie I'm trying to remake here in America, um, and it's the most beautiful movie about love and compassion, but if you mm -hmm. say the F-bomb twice, which is, uh, there's a character who's from the streets and he uses the F-bomb, yeah. you can't go. Yeah. You know, again, because that is some, that's a hint of sex, which we have to fully control. This has got to be re-examined. It, it shows right now that we are we are, we are very violent. Our culture is violent. And so it should be no surprise that violence is showing up in certain places. Sure. Mm -hmm. How do we prevent uh, the legislation of morality? Um, how do we prevent people from d deciding what is moral and what is not? Because that's really the core issue here. The fact that a, a group of people at some point decided that Female sexuality is immoral. Um, it should be kept, you know, it should be brushed under the rug, kept behind closed doors. How do we, how do we change that? Well, there's a per particular type of populism that was behind that sort of conservative struggle, and this dates back to, you know, the neoconservative movement, and you know, back in 1980s and even earlier. I mean, my, my friends here can tell you even more about this. Um, the way we do that is by introducing an alternate form of populism, mm -hmm. an alternate struggle that is resonant with people, alternate forms of stories, alternate ways of understanding the world. I'll just give you one quick example of this. In the Islamic world, which I've been working in, many of the activists that are leading the charge there are women who are in burqas and in hijabs, mm. right? They are highly feminized, even though they may appear from the Western eye to be you know, subjugated and dominated, so on and so forth. Um, so it's really important to look past the hype, look past the hype that's being fed to all of us. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Well, yeah, and if you, if you look at the history, 
you see that when you suppress the truth, it always rises up. And the fact is, is that women in many ways, forgive me guys, may be more even evolved than men because they carry life with them. There are certain sure. intuitive traits and skills. And, and, and we're certainly different. We have different strengths and weaknesses. And that truth is going to rise up. It's a done deal. We have to work hard for it. But it, you can't suppress it. It's going to rise up or we're not going to make it. We're simply not going to make it as a species if we don't allow it to rise up. So I want to go back to this issue yeah. of um, the heterosexism that the clip was trying to foreground, you mm -hmm. know, and the idea again that if we're talking about this commodification of sexuality in this very hierarchical way, very reductive, very really removed, you know, from a more sort of humanistic notion, you know, of sexuality as being totally incorporated, you know, into one's being, into one's subjectivity, that if we look at again, you know, how young people are really conceiving, you know, their sexuality as being, you know, more along a continuum, um, you know, there's this whole notion of being questioning, you know, yeah. of being sort of betwixt and between, you know, sexualities, you know, not being, you know, marked, you know, as, you know, heterosexual, um, you know, as straight, you know, in a very categorical and identifiable way. But I think that that is a form of resistance, you know, that young people are exercising that is absolutely, you know, tied into, you know, the immediacy and the relevance, you know, of social media, of, you know, um, underground networks, you know, in terms of, you know, music, in terms of, you know, other kinds of pop culture. So these are, you know, different mediums where, you know, you have this whole millennial generation, you know, that are exercising, you know, different um, ways of conceiving sexuality that totally uh, disrupt these notions, you know, of, you know, hierarchy, rigidity, you mm -hmm. know, the yep. sense of, you know, the conservative, reactionary, nuclear, you know, white picket fence family. Um, those are things that are subversive. Mm -hmm. See, what's really a concern is when we only tell stories about America or the world that are the stories of those who seemingly are in power or the stories of the most mainstream forms of media. Because it, within America and within the entire world, if you look at diverse communities, they are engaging in alternate forms of resistance or alternate forms of appropriation of social media. There's great examples dating back to the MySpace days. Remember those days oh my gosh. of youth, gay youth, yeah. Yeah. engaging in MySpace to create alternate forms of community making and community building. And this was very critical in places in the United States where the mainstream normative elements of culture would demonize these people. Right, mm -hmm. right. All right. Well, we got to take one more quick break. Let's do that. And when we come back, uh, just some closing uh, statements. And that's it. <laughs> we'll be back. Welcome back to The Point. Uh, in closing, I want to thank our awesome panelists today. You guys did an excellent job. It was a very interesting discussion. Um, Ramesh Srinivasan. Which, by the way, I'm a, a little proud of myself for pronouncing your last Amazing name. Amazing job. Right? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Siki Boo Hutchinson, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, by the way, uh, Ramesh, is there anything you're working on that you want to tell the audience about? Well, I would just, I would just ask um, our entire audience to just, you know, pay attention to, you know, telling stories that come from your own lives mm -hmm. and sharing that with all of us. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing. Mm -hmm. I, you know, blast a lot of... Um, articles and stories and experiences that I have interest in, you know, from Egypt and the Zapatista communities and elsewhere via Twitter at Ramesh Media, R-A-M-E-S-H, Media, mm. that's just one word. Um, please write me, please write all of us mm. and share your stories so we can all collectively be inspired. All right, and Sikipu, is there anything that you're working on you'd like the audience to know about? Yes, um, I have a book coming out called Godless Americana, Race and Religious Rebels, and that's due in February, and more information can be found at sikipuhutchinson.com. Oh, that sounds great. And last but certainly not least, Tom Shadiak. Uh, I Am, where can our audience find I Am? Uh, I believe it's uh, through Netflix now, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I believe iTunes as well, and uh, the DVD is available. Uh, just Google I am, make sure you Google I am and Tom Shadiak because there's another I am uh, out there. And uh, I just want to say how much I enjoyed uh, talking with you guys and you guys are knocking wonderful. it around. Yeah. I got a lot of sex to have, so can we? Uh, <laughs> Can all right, all right. Let me also thank our point contributors, uh, Peter Joseph and Chris Ryan. And you guys can check me out at The Young Turks. Go to youtube.com slash The Young Turks. And uh, it airs Monday through Friday. I will see you guys next week with another episode of The Point.